Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We're continuing our conversation with Dr. Paul Wagner uh, from University of Houston Clear Lake. Today's topic is thinking about morality. Um, Dr. Wagner is a, a, has served as a full-time professor of philosophy and logic with the College of Human Sciences and Humanities. Also, he's the area coordinator for statistics, research, and educational psychology with the College of Education at the University of Houston Clear Lake. He has also served um, as a vice president of Association of Philosophers in Education, and he was the former executive secretary for the uh, Philosophy of Education Society. So welcome back, Dr. Wagner. Thank you very much. I'm glad to see you again, DePaul. <laughs> yes, sir. So we're going to jump right in. Um, from, from the topic of thinking about morality, um, the very first question comes to mind is, what is a good person? It's interesting. The, the question ought to be a fairly simple one to ask. Uh, but in today's world, we have gotten ourselves so entangled with, well, what may be, uh, what one person may count as a good person, another person may not. That's very distracting. Because one of the things we know is that even in times of war, combatants may recognize the compassion of a fellow adversary and recognize mm -hmm. that this person is a good person at this moment and that what they're doing is certainly honorable and, um, and to be appreciated. So good persons, what are good persons? We, we all, I think, recognize it around the world. We recognize it as somebody who's compassionate, who thinks about other than just self. When it comes to the details of what, do, what should one do in this uh, specific action as opposed to another, that doesn't tell us what a good person is. That tells us how well, the person is figuring something out at the moment, but we know good persons have compassion at their heart and doing what they can for anyone involved in the, um, the social relationship at the time um, that is not injurious is what we consider to be a good person. Pretty much that's globally the case. Wow, what a definition. Um, so, so what, what is moral expert? Moral expert is somebody that knows uh, about the language that is used to create rules and guidelines uh, that help us interpret how we ought to uh, behave in a certain situation. Moral expert is a scholar, but being a scholar doesn't mean that you're a good person. It means you're a moral expert, a scholar. It's kind of interesting. A study was done on several university libraries on um, how often uh, books were um, defamed or things torn out of them or highlighted in, in a university book in the library from different subjects. And one of the uh, areas that had the most uh, uh, most books mistreated was in the area of ethics. <laughs> now, one of the things that, that shows you is that the people pulling these books down are doing so because they want to become more expert in thinking about ethics, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily good people or better people because they're interested in trying to sort out all the intellectual conundrums of creating well-meaning and uh, precisely um, uh, informative rules of action. So moral experts or scholars, they know a lot about the different rules that may be put into place in one situation as opposed to another. They recognize conundrums that prevent us from making um, making everything come together just right. A great example is uh, the Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu was once asked by a student, um, uh, are there conflicts of morality? Can there be conflicts of duty? And the um, uh, Lao Tzu has the master say to the student, um, uh, there are no conflicts of duty. Studi th the <clears throat> student, that he had the old scholar um, 
uh, in a tough position because he said, what if, this is in ancient China, and he said, what if you're walking with your sister one day and you know, she's all bound up in these tight clothes and her, uh, her feet are bound up to keep them small and, and you're walking over a footbridge and, and it crosses a turbulent stream. She falls into the stream. If you do nothing, she'll perish. If you reach down to grab her, to pull her out of the stream, you have touched a woman in public, which was considered to be a violation. And uh, so conflict of duty, is it not? And Lao Tzu, La Tzu has the master say to the student simply, you do not understand the point of morality. And that's where the parable ends. I think what Lao Tzu meant by that was that the student had confused a rule of etiquette with a moral principle. If you let someone perish, etiquette doesn't matter at all, does it? On the other hand, if you um, uh, uh, ignore rules of etiquette as a, uh, on a regular basis, you're losing some of the reinforcers that a society has put into place to support the moral commitments that are really basic and that really hold the organization together. Please and thank you are just uh, rules of etiquette. But when we say please and thank you to one another, one of the things that we're buoying up is mutual respect for one another. Wow, what an interesting way to distinct between a good person and a moral expert. Thank you. So thinking away from this a little, is, it, is tax law um, ultimately grounded in moral consideration? Tax law is ultimately bound in moral considerations. In fact, all of law is bound up in moral considerations. When we change laws to make them better, presumably the people trying to do the changing aren't doing it to make things worse. You know, even if, even if many of us think that, well, you did make it worse, but the people who are trying to change the law are for whatever reason, they think they're trying to make it better. It's true in the case of all laws. There is no such thing as a morally neutral law. And tax law is a good example of that. Because many people think of tax law as being wholly outside the realm of morality. It's, it's something that's just somehow governmental or whatever. But think what it means. Tax law is about redistributing the goods and sometimes the risks of a community. And presumably when you're doing that, that redistribution <laughs> has to answer the morality sooner or later. I mean, is this being done for good or is it being done for evil purposes? If we say that this redistribution of wealth is being done for evil purposes, we say that's morally wrong. We shouldn't do that. If we say that redistribution of goods is being done for the benefit, compassionate benefit of all who share in this community, then we say, well, that, that may be a plausible way to go. Note that I use the word plausible because I didn't want to suggest we can nail it down with certainty. But plausible means, given the alternatives, this looks like a pretty good way to go. And yes, when we have good tax laws, we think what they're doing is serving the community better than the community was served prior to those laws going into effect. Interesting. Um, is the source of moral motivation found in the uh, found in people's souls, uh, their genes, the species, uh, platonic forms, or some kind of divine absolute, community, family, uh, some combination of all the ones that I mentioned, or is it something else altogether? No, oh, gosh, uh, I I don't even know how. Uh, to begin with that, um, I, uh, for example, I'm not even 
sure I understand what the word soul means. That doesn't mean I uh, reject anybody who wants to talk about it. Um, it just means that I don't have sufficient skill or expertise to say, well, given that souls need to be treated in a certain way and that uh, what we find in human beings is simply the embodiment of souls. I know that's all a part of the talk of soulness, but I don't know that I can speak in expert fashion about, about such a thing. What I can address is that there, there are times when people want to say, all right, let's just stay with the real of the world. And, and they may point out that um, chimpanzees, for example, have 99% uh, of the same genome as human beings have. And they derive from that the idea that there must not be much difference between us and chimpanzees. Well, first of all, the overlap between the genomes isn't necessarily 99%. It could be somewhere between 92% and 99%. But even with that in mind, let's let's go ahead and be bold and take that 99%. So that means among all human beings, there's only 1% of our genome that makes one of us different from another one of us. Well, you don't have to be a genius to look around the world and see if the people next to you, in front of you, and behind you, and across the street from you are quite different. And so that 1% can lead to enormous differences between one person and another as far as how we think things matter. So uh, you can't reduce our moral reflection to simply how it is that biochemistry and electrical exchanges are taking place throughout our nervous system and so on. It seems to be that we look when we start talking about morality as no other species does, other species cooperate. But because of our richly textured language, we have catapulted the capacity to cooperate well beyond that of any other species. And in doing so, we create rules, guidelines to help us better deal with one another. Are these rules ironclad? No, they're guidelines. They're the best we can come up with to show how we might truly be more compassionate in our engagement of one and another. That doesn't mean we get it right. Fortunately, we have that language that helps us to review and constantly change and improve those guidelines. And we do it all with that 1% of our unique genome and our extraordinary language capacity that separates us from all other species. So, so emphasizing more on, on the source of moral uh, motivation, um, you know, there, there are multiple sources and I know psychology uh, counts external incentives or um, in strict, in, um, instructs like internal motivation. So when we talk about source of motivation for a moral person, is there such thing like oh, that sure. something I mean, motivates yeah, one that, person? That actually turns out to be an easy question. The only reason it seems like it's difficult is because we live in a world that keeps on wanting to make everything relative. We're a herd animal. And so the source of moral motiv motivation for us is the same as will beasts, lions and tigers, well, maybe not tigers, lions and gorillas, uh, other pri primate groups, any herd animal uh, is driven instinctually by the inclination to cooperate. So with human beings, I, 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 I feel sad at times when I hear a school teacher tell children without any science backing up what she says, she's just pontificating. She might say to them, everyone acts out of self-interest. End of story. Well, all the science that we have from evolutionary theory that applies to herd animals is that herd animals have at least two instincts. Some herd animals might even have just one, but 
most of the larger herd animals have two instincts. We do have an instinct to be self-interested, but we also have an instinct to be cooperative. Paul Bloom at Yale has done a great job of showing how infants, uh, shortly out of the, um, uh, the, the womb and in a nursery, will cry in sympathy with others of their kind. Now, one and a half and two year old children will try to assist a researcher who has accidentally dropped something near them and they try to pick it up to help them out. Um, so that instinct to cooperate is, is, is just hardwired into us. Um, going back to the 17th century, you have David Hume who talks about something called social sympathy. And he said, there's just something about us when we see something that is um, uh, hurtful to another or whatever, our natural instinct is to be unsettled by that. It's because that's hardwired into us. Now, psychologists have speculated on the basis of some research that roughly 1% of us suffer from some degree of um, uh, sociopathy. Now, a sociopath doesn't mean it's a Ted Bundy severity. Uh, a sociopath just means it's somebody that lacks conscience. You could have somebody that lived next to you your entire life who was a mild sociopath, and never had a problem with them. And the reason for that is that the sociopath does whatever they do for personal convenience. If they thought they could get away with stealing apples off your apple tree and they wanted those apples, um, they would do it. But if they thought stealing your apples was going to be something you would notice and would cause aggravation on your part and there'd be animosity between the neighbors, then the sociopath would likely not do it because it just isn't worth um, the, um, uh, the distraction to their life. Uh, the, the sociopath is very much the way some people used to think of behaviorism. You know, you, you do what you do just because of your history and the immediate stimulus of the moment. Well, yeah, from an evol evolutionary viewpoint, we have two instincts. One is to be self-interested. One is to be cooperative. Now, one of the things that follows from them is that if the things around you play a role, and what we see in the unfolding you or me as we go through life. And a phrase I like to use to help us keep that in mind is after we've understood that it was evolution that gave us our instinct to be self-interested and our instinct to be cooperative, nobody had anything to do with that. We came to the world with those things. Now, what happens to them? Now we look at culture. And so the saying I like is that culture matters, but it is not all that matters. We came with two instincts. Culture has, to, excuse me, has to work with what we've been built with. And so you can't ignore those instincts and try to conjure up either how we happen to unfold as individuals or as communities or how we ought to unfold as individuals or communities. You have to consider our instincts along with our surroundings as we go through the life that we're living at different places in the world and um, with uh, different fellow residents and so on and so forth. Wow. So going back to what you just said a little earlier, um, that chimpanzees have, uh, that we share uh, DNA with them. Uh, so chimpanzees share as much as 99 point whatever percent of the human genome. To what extent does that mean that they share the human moral experience. Um, that is to say that- But they can't, the possibly human... share, they can't possibly share the human moral experience. 
And the reason they can't possibly share in the human moral experience is what they have that is shared with us is a cooperative instinct. All of our primate cousins, along with all other herd animals, have that cooperative instinct. That's why they're herd animals. But what's missing between um, uh, our primate cousins and us is that richly textured language. The primates, even the most sophisticated ones closest to us, like chimpanzees, do not have the kind of richly textured language that we have. They have language that allows them to do various um, uh, signaling efforts, but they have no language that would allow them to contrive a system of taxation in order to redistribute the wealth of the community in a way that is optimally compassionate and not injurious to anyone. They just, they just don't have the kind of language that would allow that. Uh, our chimpanzee colleagues and uh, our other primate family cousins couldn't even attempt to build self-driving cars with rules in them that would cause them to um, uh, abort a path that the car is on if the car is heading at a breakneck speed toward what appears to be a mother pushing a double baby carriage of kids. Um, chimpanzees might be com compassionate about, such, about the disaster that may happen if you know, um, mother and children are killed, but they can't construct the rules that we can construct and that literally program into a computer. Hopefully that the computer then will be modeling our moral sense of the world. To participate in our moral sense of the world, you have to have a sufficiently textured, richly textured language that allows you to communicate with one another. And those languages, um, all human languages, as Noam Chomsky would say, they have certain basic logical structures to them. So our languages, while they, the sounds and noises and squiggles we make may make them appear different from one another at a given moment, but haven't you noticed we do a pretty good job of translating a lot of what we're trying to say, not everything, but a lot of what we're trying to say to one another. No matter how gifted we may be when we talk to a chimpanzee, we can not explain anything to them about the benefits or defaults of a tax structure. Very true. So I'm gonna throw this at you now. As an example, gang leaders or gang members and surgeons, they both use knives, right? To penetrate the body of another human being. In each case, death is sometimes the result. The gang leader or the gang member may save the life. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the gang member may kill to secure power or with a different intention or to obtain revenge against the rival. But the surgeon is trying to save a life of a person uh, that he's making the incision on. Um, sometimes things just don't work out and as the surgeon or the doctor's plan and the surgeon's experience is written off as a matter of fate or an accident, a medical accident. Right. The gang leader's killing is called or labeled as murder, murder, and the surgeon's is not, right? So right. is murder profoundly uh, wrong? Um, or and, or and is it an No, it's profoundly of, wrong. It's profoundly wrong. Okay. And one of the things that your question um, helps advance in this conversation is that the words we use are so critically important to understanding the moral world that we want to get a grasp on. The surgeon, as you say, sometimes kills a patient on a table, but they're doing their best to save a life. The, the, the gang leader may take a knife and uh, deliberately intend to end um, the, the life of somebody for whatever reason. Um, let's say they, they hunted the person down 
uh, they they were even paid to do it. They were somebody else's man at the person, and and so the the the, the gang member was paid fifty thousand dollars to go hunt this person down, and uh, put a knife in him in just this place and kill him in just this way. The difference between the two is intention. And how can we understand intention? We can only understand intention because we have a richly textured language we can share with one another to point out the differences between the two. And so murder is killing of a certain type. Murder only counts as murder, let's say first degree murder, only counts as first degree murder if the intention is to deliberately eliminate the other person's life and the intent is malicious to eliminate the life. Now, when I say malicious intent, let's take a look at a couple other things. In, um, in a lot of Western cultures, we talk about things like second degree murder some people will talk about third degree murder in the courts. They'll talk about manslaughter. They'll talk about first and second degree manslaughter. For example, if you get drunk and you get behind the wheel of a car and, and you kill somebody, uh, you will go to jail. Uh, but in the courts, no one thinks you murdered anybody because you had no malicious intent directed toward the person whose life you took. Now you were reckless in the way that you treated all of us by getting behind the wheel of a two or three thousand pound weapon and go driving around knowing that an, incapacita an incapacitated person driving such a vehicle is quite likely to be able to do damage that they never intended but to do damage to another human being because they're not in the right state of mind so we don't count that as murder. We call it manslaughter. You know, your, your neglect is criminal neglect. You showed little respect for the fellow members in your community. And you will be punished for that. But you're being punished for your criminal neglect. You're not being punished for murder. Somebody comes home from a hunting trip and they find their spouse um, in bed with somebody else. And they just happen to have their their weapon with them and it's loaded because they just got back from the hunting trip. And before you know it, they pull the trigger and, and, and kill the other spouse or the other, the other person that was there. We typically aren't going to call that murder either. Why? Well, because if the event was so spontaneous or nearly spontaneous that the person's reaction doesn't reflect deliberative intention to deny life to the other person. Rather, the behavior, if it looked like it was a knee-jerk reaction, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe, bam, that would call that second degree murder. It's interesting in some other cultures too, they will have revenge killings. And that, that sometimes gets airtime on news shows or whatever. There's a lot revealed just by the language that's even used. And cultures that endorse revenge killing, notice the word being used is not revenge murder, because revenge murder would be malicious intent. In cultures in which revenge killing is accepted, the idea is that uh, the person being killed has somehow uh, offended the, um, the family, uh, the, uh, the, the structure of the community in some kind of disgraceful way. And so the only option they see to that is to remove somebody who has deliberately made themselves hostile to the social and moral structure of the community. So they, so they remove them. Yeah. Even in societies where we have first degree and second degree murder and so on, we remove people, it's called capital punishment. We remove people from society um, when we think that their um, transgression has become so, uh, 
vicious, uh, so disrespectful, and the likelihood of them repeating that may be uh, high, even if we try to lock them up. And so we, we subject them to capital punishment. So there would be an analogy there, not a direct analogy, but there would be an analogy that those who come from a culture where revenge killing is accepted are going to argue analogically we're no different from things that you all have talked about. We just include other things as causes for this type of um, punishment than those of you in your culture might include as causes of um, uh, punishments. So the person who lives in a culture that has revenge killing them might say, uh, you, you, you killed Ted Bundy. And uh, the Americans might say, yeah, but Ted Bundy murdered a bunch of people. And we know he murdered these innocent people. And the person from the other culture said, oh, it makes sense to us that, that you have eliminated him from your society. But it also makes sense to us that when somebody has challenged, has violated the social and moral fabric of our culture by doing this, whatever this thing is that would lead to um, revenge killing, that um, we think that that's appropriate. Are there grounds for debate there? Of course there are. There's much to debate in the moral world, it's just like there's much to debate in the world of physics and in the world of biology and in the world of finance. This is one of those things that's debatable in the moral world, but within individual communities, the issue may be more well settled, tentatively at least, than it is across the geographic or historic borders of communities. So empathy plays a, a huge role in, in, in differentiating all these different intents. Wow, uh, thank you for that. Um, how are personality traits and character traits generally different from one another when we go dive deeper in, into, you know, um, the psychology of, of these individuals and their okay. intents? In, let's call our, let's talk about our folk psychology. Um, a wonderful uh, cognitive scientist and a philosopher is a, a woman by the name of Patricia Churchland, and she had been at the University of California, San Diego for many years. And um, she does a, a, a great job of distinguishing um, between personality traits and character traits. So let's kind of borrow from that, and I don't want to uh, burden her with the definitions I'm going to give, but I got the definitions in mind in part from reading her. Personality traits, let's call those part of our, our, uh, our um, social inheritance. And what do we mean by social inheritance? Going back to that sentence, culture matters. But remember, there's more to the sentence but it's not all that matters. So personality traits are traits that we inherit. You know, we didn't intend to be extroverted people. We didn't mend to intend to be shy and introverted people. That we may be that in large part because of the family we grew up in or the part of the world that we grew up in. Now we still have evolution given us a whole set of genetic traits that are gonna mix in with that too. But we inherit both our genetic tendencies and our cultural tendencies from the immediate world around us. Culture matters, but it's not at all that matters. Now, having said that, we've still got this word character floating around out there. Martin Luther King Jr when he gave that splendid talk back in 1963, that uh, I have a dream. One of the things that he says, he said, you know, you, 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 you shouldn't judge somebody because of the color of their skin. That would be irrelevant. And that would be morally wrong. Uh, by the way, Martin Luther King has 
no qualms about identifying certain things as being self-evidently true and and treating someone badly because of the color of their skin is quite certain is a moral wrong and i'm comfortable with that myself i suspect most listeners are as well but he goes on to say you can't you can even judge the content my own children by the content of their character well, what's this character stuff? What, what is this? Isn't it a product of culture? Not really, not in our folk psychology. If you're introverted or extroverted, you may look at that and say it's part of your social inheritance. That's how you do it. But if you're a liar, we tend to say you earned that description as a liar and you earned it by each lie you told. If you're a person of notable truth-telling uh, inclinations, you earned the praise that you get for being an honest and truth-telling person. When you are described as being um, uh, hideously unconcerned about the well-being of others, we're describing your character in our folk psychology. We think you got there by choices you made. And you're responsible for those only. By the same token, when we applaud somebody for their compassionate and well-meaning attitude toward others, we think they earned that accolade over time and that we've noticed over time how they do seem to be well-meaning toward others. That's character. So in our folk psychology, at least, and I think our folk psychology offers us a lot to understanding the moral world, there is a difference between things that are just personality traits that are a consequence of our either social or genetic inheritance and our character traits when we say those sort of things that you you earned, either by doing mean, horrible things to people, or um, doing kindly and nice and conscientious things uh, to people, there, there are some people I wouldn't hesitate to to, to lend a large sum of money to um, if they needed it and asked me to do so, and, and said they would pay me back by whatever the time is, and that's because I trust their character. And you say, well, I mean, exactly, give me a, give me a, a, a materialistic definition of character. I, I can't do that. But I do think our folk psychological definition and distinction of character from uh, uh, personality trait serves us well here. So I will loan the money to a person who I think their character is that of an honest and upstanding person who will keep his or her promise and pay me back. Another person who I have seen all too often lie to other people and they've asked to borrow money from me, I'm likely to say no. And I'd say, well, this time they may keep their word. Well, yeah, this time they might, but I'm not going to take a chance on my money with that person because I think there is a defect an earned defect, it didn't happen by accident. There's a defect in that person's character such that I don't feel comfortable trusting them with that money that they're asking me to loan to them. So folk psychology, uh, and, and this kind of goes back to Churchland, you know, she says, uh, you know, and, and Daniel Dennett's another one who talks about folk psychology. Folk psychology still allows us to do some pretty important thinking about how we ought to engage one another, particularly in the moral world. Even if folk psychology can't tell us exactly how certain brain mechanisms lead to certain behaviors. When we vote, every one of us is relying on folk psychology. When you vote for um, this or that candidate for office, you're voting on what you think is that person's character. And if you say, oh, no, I don't just look at her character. I look at what they say they're going to do. You're still voting on character. 
Because if you say, I'm looking at what they say they're going to do, you're obviously betting on them being truth tellers and that when they say they're gonna to try to do something, they will genuinely try to do it. So you're still voting on character. Our folk psychological language and practices just seem to be unavoidable in the real world in which we all have to engage one another. Wow, that, that's, that reminds me of a definition of character by uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, one of his books, he said, um, your character must be above uh, suspicion uh, and uh, you must be truthful and self-controlled. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, moving on to the, uh, to the next question. Uh, this is a little different. Uh, our animals, uh, including humans, as we are also animals, um, are we or the animals motivated solely by self, self-interest? Well, we've already kind of talked about that and, and, and the answer to that is herd animals, no. With herd animals, they're not motivated solely by self-interest. Herd animals from the, uh, the rhesus monkey uh, to, um, uh, to meerkats, to us, have two instincts. We do have an instinct to be self-interested. We, we don't want to die. But we also have an, uh, an interest to be cooperative. In, in human beings, there, there hasn't been a war that I can even think of where word stories that emerged from the war of some extraordinary act of heroism where one person sacrifice their own life for others. And in modern world um, wars of the 20th century and, and that, are, that are present you know, today in Ukraine, you'll hear of a story of some fellow who may have thrown his body on a grenade that was thrown into the area where he and his buddies were. Knowing that when a great grenade goes off, that's the end of his life. But he knows by throwing his body on a grenade, and taking all the concussion of the fragmentation of that weapon into his own body, he's protecting all of his buddies at the time. Now he's not doing that so he can be remembered well. That used to be one of the stories that um, behavioristic reductionists used to tell 30 years ago. He doesn't, probably he doesn't even know why he's doing it. I mean, he, he knows this, is, this will save them, but he hasn't given a lot of thought to it. He's just inclined, because evolution built this inclination, this instinct to be cooperative into him. And so in this case, I throw my butt in that grenade, I'm gonna save all these guys. I don't see anybody else can get to that grenade fast enough. Boom, I'm on it. It's not an exotic experience, as I said, in every war, that's, that's never been around. We've got stories of that sort of thing taking place. And, you know, in peace times, we have a multitude of stories of the loving mother or father who runs out in traffic uh, at the risk of their own life to pull her child out of the way of an oncoming car. And if you want to say, well, couldn't that be self-interest if you want to do the behavioristic twist because you just can't let go of behaviorism? Uh, you say, all right, let's say it's not their child. We still have plenty of stories of people that will run out in front of an 18-wheeler or a car to pull some little kid out of the way, and it's not even a little kid they recognize, but they will do that. Why? You know, because of this uh, inclination to be cooperative. I tell you a real life story that I think is very revealing of this. Here in Houston, we had a uh, not a hurricane; it was called Allison. Uh, the waters that were dropped were greater than many hurricanes had been, but we didn't have hurricane strength winds. And on live TV, there was a newscaster talking about this bayou right behind a newscaster that was overflowing, and though that water was rushing down by that bridge. Uh, it, it was terrifying to watch. And they see a guy coming down the river screaming for help. He's in the water by himself and he can't, you know, he, he can't get out of it. 
right behind the newscaster and, and she couldn't possibly have known this was gonna happen right at the bridge where she was. A guy pulls up in a pickup truck and this guy jumps out of the pickup truck. We're watching this on live TV. He jumps out of the pickup truck and he runs over to the shore of the bayou and jumps into the bayou to swim out to the guy who's drowning. There's even more to the story. This is such a fun story. Well, I don't know, it's a heroic story. There was some firemen nearby. And so they saw this guy who was coming down uh, in, the, in the river. And so they've got ropes and stuff and they start running toward where all this is going on. And they see the guy from the pickup truck go diving into the water, swimming out to the guy who's drowning. They go running along the bayou and they keep throwing rope out so that the guy who could swim well might catch it and then pull he and the other fellow back in. And well, at one point he did catch the rope and the fireman pulled him back in. Now the fireman was certainly taking some risks there running along the bayou and throwing that rope out. They could have slipped and gone into the bayou and you know they've got those big boots on and that, you know, so they could have gotten stuff away. So there was some heroism there. But what about the guy who pulls up in his pickup truck, jumps out of the truck and goes, diving into the water to help some guy who's screaming that he's, you know, he's dying, he's, he's, he's drowning. Well, as they pull him out, we see that the fellow who was drowning was an Anglo, whatever that means. And the fellow who had come out of the pickup truck and had jumped into it, looked very much like what people call a Latino, whatever that means. Now the fellow in a pickup truck wasn't checking out the melatonin in anybody's skin surface before he dived in the water. He wasn't checking out how anybody spelled his last name. He saw a human being in trouble and that was all it took for him to pull that truck over, jump out of it and dive in to try to help the guy out. And the firemen too weren't checking out anybody's ethnicity, um, skin melatonin, uh, who they voted for, what religions they might've been in. The firemen were running down there, throwing that rope out to try to get it to the, the fellow who was saving the other fellow's life. And they succeeded. They all succeeded trying to help another human being. Wow. And this was during Allison? This was during Allison, yeah. Oh. And one of the things that was interesting too, no, none of those people knew each other. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, Dr. Wagner, what, what is um, the word wise mean, uh, V-I-C-E? Can you give me, uh, can you give us some examples of wise? Uh, oh, vice, V-I-C-E? Um, vice means yes. uh, e evil intent. Uh, you know, you, you look to do bad things. You have a tendency to look to do bad things to others. There was a movie um, uh, called Seven Deadly Sins a number of years ago. And uh, the whole point of the movie was the um, protagonist in the movie had decided to go out and do evil. And he was looking for a way to uh, commit each one of the seven deadly sins, you know, to uh, uh, commit an act of vice, um, harming others, uh, and he wanted to do it in each of the ways described uh, historically by the reference to the seven deadly sins. Um, you can have uh, virtue. Virtue means you tend to have good intents accompanying what you do. Vice is just the opposite. If you have uh, vice as your intent, you're looking to... Um, be a ne'er-do-well, to harm others at the expense of yourself. Uh, and so that's what vice is. Uh, again, Ted Bundy had a vice. He wanted to slaughter innocent women. He never met them before. He wanted to slaughter them and he wanted to see the fear in their faces. And, and he wanted to show how often he could get away with it. And why would he want to do that? It was, it was a vice that had built up in him and it became a driving force. He chose, I'm sure, 
he chose we because if we thought he was mad and insane, then something in law called the McNaughton rule would have allowed him to be put in a mental hospital rather than punished um, with the, the uh, death sentence. But the McNaughton rule is doesn't say isn't about being insane or not. The McNaughton rule says your particular type of mental insanity made it impossible to know the difference between right and wrong. And um, uh, in the case of Ted Bundy, we didn't buy any story that he was just a victim of his surroundings and didn't know the difference between right and wrong. You made your choices. You knew what you were doing. Um, you uh, relied on your vices to make life miserable for so many other people, even ending it for some people. Similarly, we can look at Mother Teresa in Calcutta, and she's a woman of virtue, the opposite of vice. And um, she is, she got there by choices she made. And the more choices she made to be kindly to others, the more kindly she seemed to become a woman of virtue. There is a very um, impressive uh, philosopher uh, up at the University of Oklahoma by the name of Linda Zagzebski. And um, uh, Linda talks a lot in her writings about the role of virtue in keeping us together as we have learned over time to make virtuous choices, the likelihood that we will make more virtuous choices in the future as individuals primarily, but to some extent, even with the community, we increase the likelihood of well-being by making increasing numbers of virtuous choices along the way. And virtuous choices are based upon well-meaning intent, well-meaning intent. A vice is based upon evil intent. I want to do wrong to others. I want to make others hurt. I want to make others suffer. I want to cause loss to others. All those evil intents build up over and over as a person does more such actions with that intent in mind. And um, then they become a person driven by vice. And we have just the opposite going on with a person driven by virtue. For school teachers, every time you develop more habits in those, teach in those students that are in your classes to do something good, to open a door for somebody else trying to get through the door, to uh, erase the blackboard when no one has even asked you to, uh, to pause and not try to push through the door all at once, but to be courteous to all. All those little actions pile up and build character into those children. So they are much more likely to become what Zemzepsky would cause, would call persons of virtue as they grow up. In contrast, the more that the kids are liable to just push each other aside to get what they want, will be exposed to school teachers that actually tell them things in the classroom that everyone acts out of self-interest, end of story then those kids are gonna act out of more self-interest and they're gonna be more brutish towards one another. And they're gonna grow up with a long history of being self-oriented and get the heck out of my way if you're standing between me and something I want. Culture matters. It's not all that matters, but culture matters. Teachers are creating a lot of the culture that will affect the destiny of their students. So does TV, and so does so do podcasts, and so does Facebook. We don't have control over that stuff. But the schools are still presumably uh, under the control of our community and are there to increase the well-meaning of the community today and its well-being in the future. Um, you know, when you talk about Ted Bundy, when you bring him up, it's been, what, 30-something years, and, and it's still shocking. Um, there was another guy like that, uh, John Wayne Gacy. Mm -hmm. 
he he was part of um I, I learned about him in, in forensics. Um, and, and, and similarly, it makes you think like, what were you thinking? Like, how do you, how do you justify in your, in your mind of your actions? You don't have uh, a developed sense of cooperation. You were born with it. Uh, although anything that you're born with, there, there, there are anomalies. Like I said, psycholo some psychologists today say they've got empirical research suggesting that roughly 1% of us are sociopaths. Now, that doesn't mean we're Ted Bundy-like, uh, but it means that we do what we do only because it's convenient for us to do it or because we don't want to risk the inconvenience of um, some kind of aggravation. But for 99% of us, um, our genetic makeup has an instinctual potency to cooperate. And what we're surrounded with after we get to this world nurtures either that instinct to cooperate or that instinct to be self-interested. So with that, right, with, with what you just said, um, are there are there universal virtues? If there are, can you can you list some of them? Universal virtues. Well, yeah, uh, you, you, you can, you, you at least make the effort and it's a good effort to make. Uh, again, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. He's talking about a virtue he wants to see when he says, I wanna see it. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day little black boys and little black girls will be able to sit down at the hand, uh, at the table of brotherhood holding hands. Okay, so that's a, that's a dream that he has, and, he, and, and, and presumably in saying that publicly, he's thinking something like that is possible. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that tends to be very um, re revealing. Um, I'm thinking, what was what was uh, the other? Repeat your question again. Yeah. So, so is there uh, something like universal virtues? Oh, okay. Yeah. Bernard Gert, who is a philosopher uh, up at Dartmouth, uh, he did a study of a couple of thousand cultures to see if there were certain moral rules that across geographic and historical epics seem to continue to show up as being whatever that community would embrace. He looked at primitive communities. He looked at historically defunct communities, and he looked at many communities in our world today. And uh, he came up with 11 moral rules that he said were universal. Now there were five, and they weren't even real cultures, he said. There were five subcultures that didn't abide by these 11 moral rules, one of them being the Nazis. The Nazis were not all Germans. The Nazis were like a subgroup in Germany, which obviously had convictions quite different from the rest of the civilized world, including the rest of Germany. Um, the um, uh, Margaret Mead, an anthropologist, came back from the South Sea Islands with some kind of a story that uh, mothers broke their kids into, uh, their boys into uh, sexual practices uh, before the boys actually went on and did that. The long story, long and short story of that is other anthropologists just couldn't buy into that. And they, when they went out and studied it, they found that that never happened. The people that she was talking to were just being agreeable. And so whatever it is that she seemed to say that they were going like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We've all heard about the mountain people down in the Andes mountains. And you know, they're said to lie and steal and cheat and eat. There's less than a thousand people in that tribe. It's a tribe. It's not a culture like France is a culture or uh, the Punjab is a culture or whatever, you know? And um, so these, the, the tiny fragment of five groups that may not abide by the 11 moral rules that um, Gert articulates, he thinks are revealing that not only do we have this instinct to cooperate, but our thinking has also led us to 11 relatively reliable rules um, for, for guidance. For example, he said one of those rules is murder. 
And remember from what we said before, murder is killing with malicious intent. It doesn't include all killings. Killings in self-defense isn't a type of murder. Uh, killings on the operating table isn't a type of murder. Revenge killing isn't a type of murder. Murder is murder, and murder is killing with malicious intent. That's the only thing that counts as murder. And uh, yeah, he, he would claim that um, around the world, murder is uh, a severe violation of, our, of those 11 moral rules. With regards to slavery, last nation on the face of the earth to formally outlaw slavery and laws are those morals that the folks who hold the sovereignty of state in a community wish to endorse and can enforce. Well, by 1981, the last nation on the face of the earth outlawed formally slavery. Now, does it still go on at times? Well, sure, you can call it human trafficking is a form of slavery, but we say that people who are engaged in human trafficking are doing wrong. And we have laws against that. But the, um, uh, the nation, it was an island uh, nation off the east coast of Africa. I can't pronounce its uh, name correctly. It's like Marita, uh, has three syllables. Uh, and it starts with an M, like Marita or whatever. They were the last nation on the face of the earth to formally outlaw slavery. So again, this kind of upholds Bernard Gertz's point in saying, yeah, watch us over time. And there are some rules that we do figure out, you know, as humans, we ought not to do this sort of thing to one another. Oh, well, Dr. Wagner, once again, thank you so much for, for this deep dive into morality and, and how it plays um, a big role in all of us, right? Uh, not just educators, not just administrators, not just leaders, it's every single person. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure we will have a second part to this. This is a, a, a big subject. Um, we will continue our talk with you on thinking about morality on part, in part two. Thank I look you. forward to it. Thanks, Paul.